Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next Forensic Science Seminar. We are super excited tonight to have Mark Phillips with us from the Johnson County Sheriff's Office Criminalistics Laboratory. A couple of announcements and housekeeping issues. Um, this seminar will be recorded. It will be, um, you can find this at emporia.edu slash live if you miss it or you have someone that would like to watch it later. Um, if you're an ESU student, this is part of the ESU Monopoly game by Sodexo. So if you write down the most interesting thing you read, you heard, sorry, um, and bring it to the Sodexo office, you can get a Monopoly piece and you can play that game. Their office is on the first floor of the Memorial Union. It's the hallway by the old Biscotti and it's all the first door to the left. Um, if you guys have questions for Mark, please drop them in the comments section and we will be doing a Q and after the seminar. So stick around for that. And with all that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Mark Phillips. Uh, Mark has a bachelor's degree from Kaplan University um, in information technology for 24 years, 13 of them in uh, digital forensics, and he is now their technical leader. So with that, we are extremely excited to have him tonight and welcome him online. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time that you guys give me today to uh, do this presentation. Uh, kind of one of the things that uh, kind of came to mind whenever I was first asked about this was um, what exactly did I want to present? And a couple of things that kind of came to mind was mental health, as well as some of the misinformation that's out there. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, this presentation might be something a little different than you're normally used to with uh, social media. And uh, I hope it, uh, there's something that's in this presentation that may be helpful to you. Um, or helpful to somebody else. And that's kind of the primary thing for us is to uh, provide information that is helpful. So to not go into it too much more deeper, uh, we'll start with a couple of stats. Um, I thought this was rather interesting and it's the percentage of people um, that are social, use social media online based on ages. Uh, you'll kind of see that the ages of 65 has increased and this is a 2001 stat, um, 2021, excuse me, stat. Um, my feeling is since we've had the uh, COVID going on, I believe this has probably went up severely, uh, but just kind of an interesting information, um, as well as smartphone ownership has also increased as we would expect. Uh, so I get into the challenges and dangers of social media. Um, kind of one of the things that I, you know, was looking at um, from the perspective of social media and all these kind of apply to each other. Um, and we'll kind of go into detail on each one. So social media addiction. Um, and excessive use. We have a tendency once we get online to kind of stay on there and, and get into that. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, legal problems. Um, some of the things you run into is stalking, ID theft, um, illegal contraband, threats, cyberbullying, hate speech. Um, and then you can get into some of the challenges, which you could potentially face legal problems with. Uh, the spread of misinformation. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm going to cover further on into the presentation um, about things that may appear to be real, but in actuality, they are false. Um, so the next thing is private is privacy issues related to social media companies. Um, you don't know how much information you're giving to um, the various companies out there. A lot of the people focus on that the government is out to get me and get this information when you're probably your biggest enemy is actually gonna be some of the, um, the various people that are um, these major companies that are getting this information and using it to their benefit as well as to your benefit. So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, and social media with safety safety uh, concerns as well as scams. Um, scams are quite frequent. Um, I'm sure you receive those phone calls all the time, which has no relevancy to social media, but it may. Um, we also get into content is never deleted. That's one of the big things. Uh, when you post these things out here, um, you'll see that you know information never is deleted. If you look at some of the, the, some of the things that are going on in society where they talk about you know, uh, privacy issues with people taking photographs of uh, nudity and things like that, and then they show up later online. Um, mental health. Um, probably the biggest thing, in my opinion, um, with social media is the mental health aspect of this, and we'll get into that um, into a little bit more, um, as well as the ease of sharing. So uh, today's, the police departments also use social media, and it's actually used in many aspects. Um, it's mostly for good, but you know, we also use it to try to help to solve crime, which is kind of one of the important things that uh, we do. So today's police department uses uh, social media for the purposes of public in input and notifications, what they call crowdsourcing. So basically they can get a, uh, a lot of information out there really quickly to the people that matter. Um, and that could be just notifying of, let's say an accident, or it could be 
uh, about a major issue going on, but they use that to, um, you know, get information from the community about things that are going on. Um, it's been used to investigate and solve crimes. Um, there's actually a Philadelphia uh, police, they had a um, video that led to the quick capture of assailants. Uh, this is in 2014. Uh, there was a instance in Cincinnati where they used it to crack down on gang violence because people can remain anonymous, but yet provide information that may be able to his, assist law enforcement. Um, and then you also have uh, solving like a 34-year-old murder or 34-year-old uh, mystery with social media. Basically, they put an image out there and some of the family, because they didn't know who the person was, and some of the family was able to identify them based on the images. And uh, they was able to kind of get closure for a family. And that's kind of the important thing that we do is to try to um, bring closure in some cases, as well as um, hold people accountable and also maybe set people free. Um, so that's kind of the things that we do. Uh, together, these methods showcase how important uh, a tool social media can be. And it can be used for good and often also can be used for bad. And we'll kind of talk about that further on the presentation. Uh, so social media, uh, some of the challenges we also face is doxing, basically, where they give out information about um, people that they find online, uh, because a lot of people put a ton of information out there. Um, you kind of have to be careful with that. Uh, doxing has also been used to target law enforcement. Um, so that way they can use it to identify people of, that work in the law enforcement field that are trying to protect you. Um, and then uh, they start getting harassed and things like that. So uh, cyber stalking. Uh, this is used quite a bit when you have somebody that um, becomes infatuated with somebody. Um, and so they use that as a form of harassment. Uh, swatting. Uh, there's actually been instances where people have been killed because somebody called in a call where um, the individual has no clue the cops are coming. The cops get there and uh, they don't realize they think a crime's going on. So they come in um, and it's just kind of a surprise for all parties involved. And unfortunately, there's some things that happen. Um, that may lead to somebody um, getting arrested or um, potentially um, injured. So it's kind of just important things to take into consideration um, with the social media. Uh, virtual reality is kind of becoming a real popular thing. Um, I think there's some information out on Meta just recently about um, virtual reality and sexual assaults happening. And you know, we think, well, sexual assaults can only happen in person. That's not exactly true because some people, um, if you've ever used virtual reality, and most of you probably have in some aspects, maybe maybe not everybody since we have such a variety of people here, uh, but they can look so realistic. Um, and uh, people, kids in general, based on some of the information I see with the phones, uh, people take this serious and and they live life, um, even though it's virtual as as an as real life scenarios. So um, there's also instances. Um, where basically, um, you know, things that happen, get harassed, things like that. So gaming is kind of one of the big things. Um, and you can actually start spending more time uh, being in the virtual world as compared to a real world, because that's what you're comfortable with. And so you just have to be careful with that. And then they think they have the same powers as they have in the game. And then they go out and try to like jump buildings or whatever. And, and you know, people get injured. So um, it may sound silly, but to a lot of people, this is this is how they live their life. So um, we just have to take that into consideration. So what types of data does the consumer give out um, or types of, I guess, types of data that businesses collect? And a lot of this, even though um, it's done for good, um, it's trying to provide a user experience um, that's great for the user itself. And they gather personal information. Um, this could be information from your emails. Um, it could be for, you know, IP addresses, uh, web browsers, cookies, things like that. Um, they use this for, they try to gather engagement data um, because the previous data might be information that helps to put you person, a person in your, in your area. And that way they can kind of basically target ads for you, uh, provide you knowledge about products that you may not be aware of. And it's beneficial to you. But then again, it also can be, um, kind of a hassle. Uh, engagement of data. Uh, this type of data is consumed or active with a business, website, mobile apps, text messages, social media pages, emails. This is kind of how they get the information. Uh, behavioral data. Um, back in the day, there was a target uh, incident where there was a girl who um, was, 
I think 14 years old and uh, the father uh, saw that there was a bunch of ads coming in the mail um, and they basically uh, contacted Target and said, you need to stop sending uh, pregnancy information to my daughter. You're, 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 you're influencing her. And uh, the guy had to come back later on and come back and apologize because she was pregnant and she had uh, had a, an affair and she was in fact pregnant based on the information that she provided and looked up. So <clears throat> this information is really uh, interesting and it's becoming more and more, they're using AI to do this. So it's becoming more and more accurate. Uh, so it's amazing. Sometimes the, um, the internet or businesses know more about you than you know about you. So um, just be aware of that. Um, and uh, the, da the data encompasses metrics on consumer satisfactions, uh, purchase criteria. And, you know, that's also a positive thing because, you know, they're trying to provide a product that's great for you and you're able to come back on that. So how do they get this information? Um, a lot of it is just they just ask you for it. Um, you download an app and you kind of go over the EULA, uh, which basically just tells you what type of information they're collecting. And uh, you give it to them uh, unknowingly, but you do give them that information. So uh, they they might even call you directly. Um, these phone calls are rather annoying, but you know a lot of times they're trying to find information out um, about you. Um, websites, cookies, and, and web beacons. This is basically a way for them to uh, use what you're surfing to to get information. Uh, the other thing is with, especially with social media, a lot of times we fill out these, these um, questionnaires about what type of person are we and who we're from and what we're doing. Um, and a lot of that, they're just gaining more and more information about you because you've given your email. And so now they're just able to gain more and more information. And this can also be used, you know, as the bad, as, 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 as a, uh, a criminal gathers that information illegally uh, and uses that to target you um, for fake IDs and things like that. Uh, the other thing they do is email tracing uh, or tracking and apps and third party, which I've kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's just ways for a business to collect a lot of information about you. And it may seem uh, not like it's that big a deal, um, but it's, it's amazing uh, the amount of information that is out there. Uh, we receive a lot of cell phones and we learn, learn a lot about people. That's kind of one of the things that we do. And we're not intentionally trying to get into somebody's business with cell phones, but it's amazing the information that people share um, and that we can actually see and, and kind of get an idea of what type of person they are. Uh, sometimes we don't want to know that, but um, you can just by looking at somebody's phone, you can figure out pretty quickly of what type of person they are. And if you take a business that has um, a tremendous amount of resources trying to uh, gain information about products, they're going to go as far as they can with that. So just be aware of it. Um, so they also do company records and social media. Sorry, I kind of got off on a tangent. Um, they dig deep into your customer service records um, and gain information about you. Um, so for advertising revenue, and this is kind of the big reason behind why companies do what they do. If you look at the amount of money that was made from social media, social media advertising in 2012, it was, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the first six months is about 1.7 million or billion, excuse me, um, and 2.9 billion. But now in 2019, and again, I didn't have the most current stats into 20 and 21 and then 22, yeah, 21. But in 2019, it's $16.5 billion in the first six months. That's a lot of money in advertisement. Uh, so they're, you know, if you've ever watched The Social Dilemma, if you have not, it's on Netflix. I would highly recommend it. Um, it talks about, you know, what they, what type of information they're collecting and, and some of the, the caveats behind it. But um, and then, in, you know, in 19.1 million, it, it's just it kind of blows my mind the amount of money they make off of this. And this is an example of a company that is um, trying to sell the uh, gathering of information. And you can see based on this, this statement, uh, it's an independent jewelry store, um, Slate and Tell, and they were looking to build awareness and considerations during peak selling seasons. And then by leveraging TikTok for business easy use, a uh, smart video creativity tool and optimized campaigns to events, they created fun and engaging uh Creativity that reached four, 4 million TikTok users and resulted in a thousand single session ads to cart conversations, helping them achieve their goal of two times return on ad space spent. So that means that 
they did this advertisement and they made a tremendous amount of money from it. And again, it's a good thing because we get products and we find things that are of interest to us. But are you really wanting to give out that amount of information and, and, and to do that? So um, this is kind of a misinformation uh, perspective. Um, deep fake. Um, it was made news, I think, in 2017 is when it kind of became popular. And basically what it is, is um, the use of deep learning, artificial intelligence, AI to repl uh, replace the likeness of one person with another digital media. And I'm going to show a video on this um, and it'll kind of give you an idea of the power of, of deep fake and how it can be used. Um, there's no instances that I'm aware of in the United States being used recently or currently. Um, but in other countries and things, it, it is being used and it could be used as a tool to basically um, say bad things about us. And it appears to come from the person in here. So I'll go ahead and play this video. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. What happens when seeing is no longer believing? When public figures are recorded saying and doing things that they never said or did. Advances in machine learning and AI have now made it possible to swap someone else's face and voice into a video and make it look like they did or said something, anything you want. And this has lawmakers worried. 99% of the American population doesn't know what it is. These videos and photos are called deep fakes and they're getting more sophisticated by the day. In April 2018, BuzzFeed created a video that appeared to show former President Obama warning against fake news and trashing President Trump. See, I would never say these things, at least not in the public address. It went viral and introduced deep fakes into the mainstream. But the person featured in that video was actually comedian and filmmaker Jordan Peele, and the video made that clear, serving as a public service announcement about deep fakes and how they could become ubiquitous in the future. The technology harnesses machine learning techniques, feeding the computer real data about images so it can create the fake. So the first process is, of course, getting, getting the data and the feed that data to our algorithm. Now, the only information that we have for our algorithm is the sequences of the frame from each Barack Obama and Donald Trump or John Oliver and Stephen Colbert. Our algorithm used both spatial and temporal information to learn a mapping from one person to another person. Ayush Bunsel and his colleagues at Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute are working on algorithms that can essentially retarget the style of one video to the content of another. Things like being able to synthesize a sunrise video based on data gathered from the video of a sunset. He says these methods have applications beyond deepfakes and can be used to improve computer vision technology for self-driving cars, virtual reality, and robotics. Elsewhere, at the University of Washington, Researchers have been able to synthesize lip sync videos based on audio clips. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday. Experts say that although it may be easy to create a deep fake, it's actually very hard to create a flawless one. But as Will Knight, MIT Technology Review's senior editor for artificial intelligence says, it will get easier and easier. Besides, you might not need something very sophisticated to do real harm. It's easy to see how people could use deep fakes to spread misinformation about politics or anything else holding up the faked videos as supposedly incontrovertible evidence. Perhaps worse, over time, as deepfakes become more common, people might stop believing legitimate videos. The implications are serious, and there are no laws that currently govern the technology. In September 2018, three U.S. lawmakers sent a letter to the Director of National Intelligence, urging him to look into the issue and come up with recommendations about whether the intelligence community requires additional legal authorities or financial resources to address the threat posed. The only way which comes to my mind to counter the problem of deep fake is to have machine learning models that can just say that this is a real or this is a generated. Researchers, startups, and even the government are already working on tools that can suss out deep fakes. The U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, is running a program called Media Forensics, which has turned its focus lately to identifying artificial intelligence powered manipulations. Combating deepfakes will likely require a mix of several approaches. But as with any plan to fight emerging technology, once a method is rolled out, the deepfake creators might just find a way around it. And the fight against fake will continue on. As Will Knight puts it, 
It is also troubling how technology is eroding the very concept of ground truth. This is something that could have profound political consequences. I find it very disturbing. So as you can tell in that, um, it's it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, we've seen there's been a lot of things out on the news about the election and what have you. And I don't want to get into any politics, uh, but you can see how easy it could be to confuse and uh, alter people's thoughts. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit further in this presentation as well. But it's just things to keep in mind. Um, if it sounds too good, it might be too good. Um, but, um, this slide is, this slide kind of talks about social media and its effect on mental health, um, kind of changing gears a little bit here. Um, I think it's out of the place, but, uh, it's, it's some things that, again, we take for granted. It, it distracts you from work. It uses to escape from bad emotions and you become trolled by cyberbullying. Uh, spend more time with online than with family and the feelings and anxiety. And we'll kind of talk about that here in a little bit. So positive effects of social media. Um, these are some things that, you know, that we found that actually is, it helps um, some people. Um, and it's communicate to stay up to date with family and friends around the world. I know for me, um, especially now with the COVID and what have you, it's it's been a great uh, blessing to have this um social media to be able to talk to friends and family um, remotely without actually having to converse with them. And it's actually probably it's what saved us as a world, um, you know, and a lot of companies have actually started using it in, you know, in their business, business models as well. It's a loss also allowed us to find new friends and communities, networks uh, with other people who share similar interests and ambitions. And again, you kind of have to use caution with this, but it's, it's something that you never would have been exposed to. Um, back in the day. Um, it's, it also gives you the ability to join or promote worldwide causes. And you see a lot of this out there. You also see a lot of scams. You have to be careful with this. Um, but it raises awareness on important issues such as suicide, um, which I feel in the world that we live in is, is actually huge, especially amongst our young people as well as some of the older people. And with, with the isolation nowadays, um, it's, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty tough on everybody. Um, it also, for people that have different points of view, um, it gives them the ability to uh, connect with other people. Um, seek or offer emotional support during tough times. We probably see this quite frequently with the COVID going on. Um, and it's a way to kind of reach out to friends and family and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, you could pick up the phone and call somebody, which works just as well. But some people don't like to talk on the phone. Some people don't like to text because they have fingers that are a little fatter than others. Uh, so again, it kind of gives you the ability to, to do those types of things. Um, find vital uh, social connections. Uh, if you live in remote areas, um, you know, you may have that where I lived at. We had a town of 1,240 people. They got pretty boring after a while. So it gave me the ability to kind of start reaching out and talk to other people outside of my area, as well as gain gather information about things that may not be skewed um, from their perspective. Um, Find outlet for creativity and self-expression. Um, it's given people the ability to start selling some of their um, artwork as well as share that with the world. Um, again, just have to use care with it. Uh, discover with care sources of valuable information and learning. It gives us the ability to look up a lot of information uh, that, that you know, we're interested in. Um, the other thing it does, these are some of the negative effects. Uh, provides a platform for individuals to hide behind a keyboard. Um, we see this quite frequently whenever we process phones for criminal threat, threat and what have you. Um, and then we also see the emotional scars that comes from that. Um, people really, truly take what people say to heart. Um, probably it seems like even more so with words that are being typed because people have a tendency to uh, show emotions through facial features, things like that. And with typing and text, you don't know exactly what's going on. So you kind of potentially become paranoid um, in some aspects uh, about what's being said. And maybe th you think it's about you. Uh, pop people often use it to compare their life or appearances to others on social media. Um, you'll see a slide coming up further about um, somebody that actually has um, did that. So 
Uh, the fear of missing out. Uh, this is kind of a big one. And originally I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, but it's, you know, you start getting so caught up on what's going on in social media. You want to see that next like, you want to see that next comment and, and, it, and it excites you. And it kind of, it's almost like a drug. Um, you start getting this, the same feeling and, the, and they say for uh, social media, and I hope I'm not, I not getting to my presentation too much, but um, the, the, uh, social media addiction is just as bad, if not worse, than drug addictions. Uh, you become so focused on it that you start doing all you can to to get that high and getting that like maybe something that some people really enjoy, um, and 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 you kind of become addicted to it. So uh, something you have to use in, you know, sparingly. Uh, the study at the University of Pennsylvania found the high uses of Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram increases rather then decreases feelings of loneliness. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting because I see for me, it, what I feel, it, it gives me uh, a sense of, of, of accomplishment. But then there are times where it does make me feel lonely. So um, it, it, I, I, I guess I can see it. About 10% of teens reported being bullied on social media, which will kind of go to that next. Um, but what was also an interesting, staggering information to me uh, the average user spends approximately 136 minutes over over two hours on social social networking sites each and every day. And according to this new study uh, published by the Journal of Behavioral Addiction, Addictions, not only does this time spent on social media platforms wait, waste countless hours of the day, excessive use can also start to affect people's decision making abilities and make them more likely to engage in risky behavior. And we've wondered why sometimes you have these people that are behind the keyboard making these comments. It's it's potentially because exactly what we're talking about is that addiction, uh, just like drugs can charge, you know, uh, drugs can charge, you know, cause issues as well. Um, even though you may see an image on, on the social media and say, ah, that's fake, but your brain really doesn't take it as that. So Here's an example of a former Instagram model. Um, she edited her post to reveal truth behind photos. And I thought it was rather interesting. Um, the fact of, you know, she was the one that's taking these photos and she, you know, kind of got the high from it. Um, and then eventually she realized that it was becoming, you know, a part of her and, and, and it, she kind of became trapped. You know, you start making this money and you feel that's what you have to do. So, um, what originally starts out a, a, a inspiration, a passion, it turned into something different than that. So it's just kind of a, an example of um, how, you know, it can affect you. Um, this next person is a person who is actually what they call an influencer, which I thought was a rather interesting term. Um, and she basically spent hours and hours and hours to create this single video that people paid or watched over and over again. And she made money from it. So it becomes, it kind of becomes your 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 ability, your job. Um, but then a lot of things they don't realize when they start reading comments by other people that it how much it affects people. And and she had a kind heart. Um, now she still does it. I you know I shouldn't say a kind heart, but she realized some of the ramifications of what she did is you know by having these perfect images that she edits, spends tons of times editing, and it goes out to these kids and say, see this perfect person, and start comparing themselves to them. And, and they just start having a lot of, of uh, uh, self-conscious issues um, because after a while, seeing is believing. So um, perception is reality is another adage that's been out there. And, and the same thing applies for social media. You start looking at it enough, it again becomes, becomes a reality. And then you try to achieve that reality when really it's not achievable. So um, people start having issues with mental illnesses and what have you. And, and I think that some of the things that are going on with the kids nowadays, um, and it's not the kids' faults, it's, it's, it's just how things are being used. Um, I think that plays a part into it. I don't think it's the only thing because there's a lot of stuff going on right now, um, but it is a part of it. So how do you define, this is how we, or how it's defined. I should say, this is my uh, thing that I took from one of the websites. Um, all the references are down below, but uh, it's willfully and repeatedly uh, harm inflicted to the use of computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. Willfully, the behavior has to be deliberate, not accidental. Um, harm, the target must be perceived that harm is inflicted, and computers, which is the device that's used, 
Um, this can be a little different, but it still plays a part in that. Um, so cyberbullying is that takes place over a digital device, as I kind of talked about. Um, it can occur through SMS, text, apps, online. There's all kinds of ways to do that. Um, and so a lot of this is going on and people are getting bullied um, by other people just for fun because they think it's fun to harass somebody and make somebody feel horrible. Um, and again, people take it seriously. Um, it can be include sending, posting, or sharing neg negative har harmful, false, or mean content about someone else. It can include uh, sharing a personal or private information, which we talked about before of, of the doxing, uh, sending out information, and then somebody else is getting bombarded. And once it's sent out, there's really no way to take it back. Even though you start feeling guilty about it, it's out there. And so it can cause embarrassment and humiliation. And a kind of an interesting thing, as I was reading through some of the texts that I was out there, and they talked about how uh, parents are posting images that are um, negative about their child or maybe even just photos that are that are kind of incriminating. And before that was kind of kept behind their closed doors and, and, and within family. And it's kind of a funny thing. But once it gets out on social media, then no longer is it there um, under their control. So you have to be very careful. Um, with your kids, even if they're younger, about posting pictures and things like that. Um, because later on down in life, it may be something that humiliates them. And so taking that consideration um, is one thing to do. It may, may be cute right now, but to them, it may not be. Um, and they don't have a voice to try to change that. And once it's out there, it's out there. Um, and then cyberbullying is not very much, or, you know, not different than uh, in, in real life. The only problem is, is you can't really get away with from it. You can stop getting on social media but again, we talked about those percentage of people online. Again, the average user spends approximately 136 minutes over two hours on social media. So that means that they're on their web, you know, on their social media account and these pop-ups keep coming up and you get these notifications. And so you just can't get away from it. And at some point you may think, well, I have nothing else, um, you know, that I can do about it. And you do something horrible. Um, so... It's uh, these are the types of uh, cyberbullying victimization, um, and it, it's I thought it was pretty staggering. Um, I have been I have been cyberbullied over a lifetime over 36.5 percent. It's a pretty high percentage, and it says approximately thirty seven percent of the students in our sample report experienced cy cyberbullying in their lifetime. And I thought that's pretty staggering from the perspective of even normally in a high school. And when I grew up, you know, it wasn't, you know, you had bullying, but it, it wasn't 37% of the time. So um, the other thing was, is by gender, uh, females, of course, um, have a tendency to be cyber bullied uh, more frequently than, than guys uh, or boys. And part of it is probably to do the reporting issue, but then again, um, it's out there. So, um, this could also be because of alternative lifestyles, um, things that people have chosen to do, um, and they're bullied for that. So um, this is kind of an interesting thing, and I hadn't really thought about it. And you, you hear things about freedom of speech. It's my freedom of speech. Say whatever I want to say and when I want to say it. Well, that's not exactly true. Um, there is legal impl implications for uh, speech. Um, some of the things you can't do is publish our thoughts or ideas in a form of speech that often is protected by for a minute. Having the right to free speech, however, doesn't mean that we can say what we want to say when we want to say it. You can't, for example, publish threats against someone else or ruin their reputation. And you may not be doing it. And again, it comes back to you have to do it on purpose. But, you know, again, once the information is out there, it's out there. So you have to be, you know, careful about what you post. And sometimes what you post may come back to haunt you and it may um, cause you to um, get in legal trouble. Um, so uh, some of the things that you can do that might be able to help you out um, is these are the social networking safety tips um, that I pulled from, um, I believe it's Norton. Um, and that is be cautious of, of sharing too much. Uh, we have a tendency to include myself of tendency to share all the things that are going on in our lives and and what have you and the more the more posts you do like that the more information the more um firepower people have to understand who you are and what you are and they might be able to replicate you 
Um, and when I say replicate, you mean what I mean is they can um, basically say, yeah, I know Mark Phillips. He's he loves to go out and kayak and he loves to do that. And yeah, I know him. He's a great guy. But uh, you know what he said about you? And and I have may have no clue to who that is. So um, just be careful. Be careful of what you share. Um, if you go out and do something, don't you don't necessarily have to share it right away. If you're out in the lake and and you're enjoying and having fun, enjoy and have fun. Don't post that that post saying, hey, I'm out here at the lake um, when well, you want to come out and visit, because there may be somebody out there that's lurking, that's looking at somebody else's Facebook account that they got the password for and they're out there stalking you. So not to scare you, not to, uh, you know, just just be cautious about what you do. Um, adjust your privacy settings. Um, this is almost a daily, daily thing. Um, I have a tendency, and again, I'm laxed in this area. I have a tendency to just kind of let it go. Uh, but nearly also all social net networking sites have the ability to preset or default privacy settings. Um, they People often feel that these settings are sufficient enough to never put forth effort to make changes. Um, that's not correct because we see updates all the time. And again, intentional or unintentional, they're gathering more information and they do testings a lot of times with these updates, but as we know, they don't always go as expected. Uh, limit details about work history. This um, I, I somewhat disagree with because LinkedIn um, has, there's a lot of companies out there using this for hiring, um, but you know, try not to limit yourself on that. Uh, most people aren't going to LinkedIn to find information about you. Um, but just be aware of it. Um, sometimes you can put the information out there and hide it. But again, it's still out there. But, uh, you know, limit, limit your information, because the more information people have, the better um, way and you know, better things they can do to make, make uh, you a false person. Uh, verify who you're connecting with. Don't just accept friends, friend requests from anybody and everybody. Um, it's not a competition of how many people that you have in your account. Um, it's how much, how, how many quality people that you have in there and how can they help you as well as how can you help them? Um, and, uh, you know, just, I see people all the time asking to, to friend me and I have no clue. There are three, three people removed and, and really when it come down to it, it, it's a bot. So, um, just be aware of that. Uh, keep control of your comments. Uh, again, remember anything you post is going to be out there forever. And that includes information when you was, uh, you know, people in, in, in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, if they're getting on social media, um, that may be their coach that's reading this information. So be aware of everybody um, that who, who could be reading it. I always try to take the perspective of, do I want my grandmother to read what I'm putting out there? Do I want my coach, do I want my future employer to see what is out there? Um, and if I don't, then I'm not going to post it. Um, I am probably more of a troll where I just, you know, look at people's pictures and I don't comment a lot. But um, that's just because sometimes I don't have anything to say. So uh, just be careful. Uh, don't share a ton of personal de details about yourself. Um, if you want to share personal details, call that person, talk to them on the phone. And, and share that information, but don't do it on social media. There's not really a place for it. Um, also be careful of the phone numbers <clears throat> that you have on your website or Facebook page. Um, again, hide that. Or personally, I don't a lot of times even put that information in there. Um, people that you need to get a hold of, you can usually do a search and find them. Uh, check out your own account every now and then. Um, Look at your uh, what's being shared. Make sure that your privacy settings are to friends, um, and even friends, friends with friends is if you have somebody out there, your your security is only as good as yourself, but it's also the security of your friends. Um, and so, if you have friends of friends of friends, and they have no idea who they're accepting into the friendships, they may have access to your account. So um, be aware of that. Uh, try not to share a lot of information. Uh, there's certain things you can share, but there's certain things you don't, don't need to share. Um, uh, know your employer's boundaries or acceptable use, acceptable use policies. And this goes for schools uh, as well as colleges and what have you is um, they do look at your, your posts and, and it's their responsibility to know kind of what's going on in their school. And so if you're making threats to people and making comments about teachers and what have you, 
you know, it, it could come back to, to hurt you later on if something does end up happening and you may not have intended it for it to go that route, but somebody else may be maybe blackmailing you. They saw it on your post and now they're trying to do something to get back at you. And now it looks like you said or did something um, that is uh, unlawful. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, control, control what information uh, is shared with outside sources. A lot of times you'll sign in with Facebook and other accounts and uh, you're sharing information about you to people outside your circle um, of your social media account. Um, like I talked about before, be careful of overfriending, um, accepting anybody and everybody. It's not a competition. Um, the more people they have on your, your account, the more people that know more about you. Um, and I don't know about you, but I try to be somewhat of a, a pretty um, closed information person. Some may argue with me on that, but just try to be careful. Um, considering forming a new social network, and it's not creating like uh, you know, whatever account, but let's just say you're on Facebook and you're starting to get a lot of threats and what have you change to another platform. There's tons out there. Um, make sure you do research before you do so. Um, Facebook and Twitter and all those are not the only ones out there, um, but there are others out there. And I like to try to find uh, platforms that aren't just geared towards my uh, view of life as, as a whole. Um, I try to get it an open, that's why I like Facebook so much is, you know, it's, it's kind of an open platform, people that are, um, I don't know, people that are Republicans, Democrats, you know, whatever. Um, I get a view of everything and I listen to everything people have to say, because the more information I have, if anything, if I disagree with it, at least I know what's being said. So the, you know, the, the theory of having more information is, is, you know, is ideal. Um, no, uh, what goes online stays online. Again, I've talked about this before. If you look up any uh, of the photos and things that have went out there about celebrities and you search for that person, I guarantee you'll see that image. And there have been court cases where people have been sued and found guilty of, of privacy issues, but their images are still out there because there's no way for them to remove it. If law enforcement could remove every single one, they would, but they can't. Um, know how to block and unfriend followers. If you have somebody that's annoying you, block them. You don't have to listen to what they have to say. Just take them off your friends list and 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 go about your way. Uh, keep passwords strong. The more strong the password, the better off you are. Um, a lot of uh, different, um, like the Apple phone has ways. If I store my passwords in there, it tells me if they're weak password or, or, or more secure password. But just try to make it um, hard to guess for other people. So good. Uh, again, social media is not all bad. It may sound like it's all bad, but it's not. Um, it enables you to communicate and stay up to date with friends. We've kind of talked about this before, but I'm trying to reiterate. Um, use it. Use it for the good. Don't use it for the bad. Use it for the good. If somebody says something negatively, just overlook it. And I know that's easier said than done, but I think we get so caught up in um, our views that we just don't realize that other people have different points of view on that. So if they have a different point of view, let them have it. Um, you know, it, that's your right to also have your view. So uh, move forward. Um, find new friends and communications, network and other people. Um, join or promote worthwhile causes, raise awareness on important issues. Seek or offer emotional support during tough times. Um, find uh, social connections if you live in a remote area so that way you can gather more uh, information and uh, get a different view of the area. Um, find an outlet for your creativity and self-expressions. You know, do things that make you feel good. Uh, send them out there. Uh, discover with care sources of valuable information. Again, you have to take it with a grain of salt, the information that's out there. Um, the cost of social exchange uh, and includes uh, both psychological harm such as depression, anxiety or jealousy and other costs such as wasted time, energy and money. Um, these are the things that I really, truly believe uh, if you especially begin in the virtual reality and the meta and whatever, um, there are people that are truly living in this virtual world and, 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 and really being bullied, I guess. So 
these are some negative things that come from social media. Annoying content includes a wide variety of content that annoys, upsets, or irritates, such as disturbing or violent content or sexual or obscene content. Again, we've talked about this before. If it's if it's a particular platform that you're seeing a lot of this, uh, change platforms. Uh, defriend people. Uh, you don't have to see that. Um, it's just something you can kind of try to stay away. If it's not easy, uh, it may not be the cool thing, but in the end, it'll it'll be good for you. Uh, security threats um, also refers to harm or fraud, deception such as phishing or social engineering. This is used a lot um, because you send out the they send out these these um, surveys and you don't know who's sending them out. And you fill them out and say, yeah, I'm this type of person. I'm this type of person. These are the places I've lived. Again, it's just more information they have. Cyberbullying includes any abusive harassment by groups or individuals, such as abusive messages, lying, stalking, or spreading. We've talked about a lot of this already, and this is kind of just a rehash of that. Um, low performance versus negative impact on job or academic performances. Kind of a big thing, and also with families. Um, that's that's kind of where this mental thing comes in. You get sucked into this, this thing. It's just like a drug, and and you start neglecting your family and friends and, and or family in particular um, and uh, or your job and you're spending more time on social media than you are actually doing your job. And when you're working remote, that even gives you more of a chance to do those types of things. So just stay on top of it and don't let that uh, entice you into doing bad things. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, and the majority of team thinks this is kind of an interesting thing. And, and I don't know what the age groups, I think it may be in here, but I, I don't recall what it was. But the majority of teens think parents are doing a good job of addressing online harassment, but are critical of teachers and social media companies and politicians. Um, they think parents are doing a pretty decent job of, of, of you know, keeping things in check. Uh, law enforcement not doing as good um, about, you know, addressing harassment and whatever. And I think that's a lot of that. I think that comes down to miseducation um, because it's hard to grasp this, this understanding of, okay, um, this is a virtual situation and there's really no laws about it in some aspects. Um, and it's just a different way to approach it. So um, I kind of have to stick up for them a little bit, but then on the other hand, I've seen, I've seen both sides again, me working in the forensic lab, um, I, I, I keep a subjective uh, view of things. And so um, I see the data and I use that to provide it to the detectives to do their job. Um, so I can see how that happens because you hear comments and whatever. But for the most part, people, once you kind of explain it to them, they understand it. Teachers, again, it's interesting to see the differences that 58% uh, as compared to 42% bystanders, and this is an interesting one as well, is these people are standing by and watching this happen and not do anything about it. Uh, you need to have courage and you need to stand up for what you believe in and in, in, in them as well. Um, elected officials, it, you know, they're, according to this, they're just doing a horrible job. And I don't know whether that was for laws regulating it or if it's just overall, um, you know, I don't know. So um, getting close to being at the end here, um, trying to cut it right about an hour or a little bit, maybe a little bit less. Um, but these are some things to, when you're posting on Facebook or any social media site, things to kind of take into consideration. Assume that everybody will see what you publish. You have little control over what, who might see what you see. People could look over the shoulder and if they see it, or they snicker about it, show their friends, even though they may not be friends and you may not want them to know what information is being out there. Now that's out for the whole world to see. And now these people are starting these, 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 this rumor. So if you never post it, somebody can't say anything necessarily negative about it. Uh, consider that people might use what you have to publish to make fun of you or cause harm. Um, how might your worst enemy use what you have published? Think about that. You know, um, how can somebody use this? And that's not to become paranoid, but it's something to be aware of. So, you know, if you make a statement and if it, and you truly believe in it, stick with it, you know, but, you know, don't discredit what they have to say either because you have an opinion. They have an opinion, um, something that's kind of my pet peeve, as you can tell. Uh, do not publish inappropriate language or gestures. You do not want people to judge you negatively when you see your work. 
That's your employers. That's your teachers. That's your coaches. They're going to see this stuff. And you don't want to give a bad impression. Uh, they talk about that first impression. Well, first impressions kind of gone way by the wayside because now it's them looking at your face, Facebook account or uh, various accounts out there that are open and seeing information about you before you even get that interview. Um, so be careful of what you're posting out there. Do not publish something that you did not create. Um, as you can tell on my slides here, I tried to be very uh, thorough in uh, providing the resources of where I got this information because I can't just make this up. Well, I could, but that just wouldn't be appropriate. Um, so I reference everything that I had to say um, and where I got it from. You'll need to do the same. Give credit where credit is due. Um, involve a trusted person. If you're before you're posting somebody and we have a tendency to be really, really reactive um, and say things we don't necessarily want to say or maybe what we want to say, but we shouldn't be saying, um, have somebody look it over. Just like I had somebody look over these slides beforehand and I said, hey, can you look these over and make sure this makes sense to you? And there are a few things they found that didn't make sense. Um, and so giving that second set of eyes, is kind of like when you're doing your English paper, if you're in college or school or whatever, and you have somebody, hey, can you look at this and make sure this makes sense? Make sure that there's no grammatical errors. Um, it's not cheating, it, it's, it's using your resources. Um, uh, so questions to ask yourself, would anybody be embarrassed or hurt by what I publish? This is again, being sensitive to other people. Um, we as humans now have become so stuck on ourselves. We don't care what anybody else has to say or do. Uh, we say it and then we realize maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, and this goes with loved ones as well. Um, who will be able to see what I pub published? As we mentioned before, assume that everybody sees it, but Understand that, you know, if you have your security says set down pretty well, it helps to eliminate that, but it doesn't completely get away with that. And again, it's going to be out there forever. So make sure you're not you're careful what you do it. We've talked about what my coach friend teachers say. Um, how would I feel if this um, how would I feel if the head of my dream job or dream uh, school saw what I published? Um, interesting enough, I had um, recently looked at a uh, application and and. One of the things in interview that was brought up, it was something for my social media account. Thank God it was something that was um, very positive. And uh, they asked me questions about that. So be aware that it's out there and they're looking at it. Um, am I proud of what I published? We've talked about that probably a nauseam. Uh, do I have a clear and concise about what I published? Um, people have a tendency to either intentionally or unintentionally read into what you have to say. And so read it over and over again and try it again. That's why you want to have a different point of view. Uh, but one of the things that I, I just want to take home from this is just like anything in life, moderation, right? And so you want to do everything in moderation. So you, again, be online is great, but try not to spend your life there. Um, again, be aware of the other side. Um it's kind of a, some quotes. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, one of the uh, Aristotle says it's in the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Again, that's having a different point of view um, about something. And I apologize for flipping. I keep trying to scroll and it's not working. Um, wishing to be friends is quick work, but friendship is a slow, ripened fruit. Remember that when you're online. And that's by Aristotle. Uh, remember that a friend is somebody that's going to be with you thick and thin. It's not going to be somebody that's going to waver one way or another. And it's going to take time. Um, I have my best friend that I've had since high school, and I will not go into when I graduated even before that. Um, it'll date me. But um, it's taken me a long time to, to have somebody that I trust to that extent. Um, and another one by Plato, uh, human behavior flows from three main sources, desire, emotion, and knowledge. So having an understanding and having a knowledge is probably the most important thing. And I like those quotes by these various uh, famous people. And who would have thought that we would have been quoting these, you know, many, 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 many years later. So one of the things kind of in closing that I wanted to, uh, I guess, challenge everybody with. Um, and I'll tell you, I did this um, and I failed the first time. And uh, I, I guess I'm an addict uh, to social media. 
Uh, but eventually I was able to accomplish it. And in the feeling of, of relief that I had from doing this social media detox challenge um, was actually very beneficial. And my mood and my, my overall mental health increase. And that's why I want to make sure it's very clear that mental health, social media, and that it goes with everything in life right now. Um, mental health is huge. Um, I've unfortunately lost my, um, my nephew to suicide. And, you know, I can't say it was due to exactly social media, but I can say that it's a real thing. Um, and this thought of, you know, uh, it's, they'll get over it. Um, you're making too much of it those don't work. So um, I think one way that might help you uh, is to do a detox challenge. And you can kind of see here, step one, spend five days tracking your mood while you're using social media as a norm. Um, how do you feel? What do you feel? Um, you could even keep track of how a post makes you feel. Um, but that way you can kind of get a different perspective on that. And then for 25 days, delete social media apps from your phone. Uh, tablet, everything, and resist the temptation to peek into your computer over a, over a friend's shoulder. Um, because you'll find that you will be, it's, it's going to be a lot harder than you think. Um, even if you don't use it a tremendous amount of time, you'll be, you'll be surprised. At least I was. Uh, maybe it's just me. Um, for the 25 days, set goals and work on them regularly. Continue tracking your mood and activities on the on the uh, provided app and task sheet. We don't have an app sheet, but you can keep track of a journal. Um, and I'm not a journal person, so I use my my phone to uh, write everything down. That doesn't mean you have to do with the phone, but um, applications in particular um, is a great way um, to keep track of what is going on. And then keep that for reference later on. And step four, at the end of the month, share how the DTEC affected you in short write up a video emphasis welcoming but not required and this i the video itself could be for yourself because that way later on down the road you can do this and this was set up for um it was actually i believe it was at&t they they were offering twenty five thousand dollars for people that would put this uh do this detox challenge and post their information out there and it wasn't posted on facebook but it was posted out there and um i'm sure they had Tons of people that that applied, but I don't. I bet you didn't have as many as you would think. So that kind of concludes my uh, presentation, and I'll entertain. I'll entertain some questions. Um, you know, from here on out, uh, I just wanted to thank you for you know again allowing me to do this. Um, you know, it's it's interesting with cell phones and whatever, and 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 some of the things that we see in the forensic realm, um, text messages, the things that are shared. Um, and the ways that you can learn about a person strictly by just looking at their phone. And you could do the same thing. You can look at your text messages and say, okay, what's this text message about? And, and just look it over your footprint and you'll see, is this really who I am? If it's not, then you're probably living in a false world, just like some of the other people out there. So uh, thank you again for your time. And uh, that's it. Okay, that was awesome, Mark. Thank you so much. And I actually took some tips myself for things I probably shouldn't be doing on social media. Um, we have a question from Ryan who says, you mentioned that nothing's ever truly erased. What does that mean? If someone deleted, deletes a post, how does it live on? Is it actually erased or do you simply have uncertainty if it was saved by somebody else? That's exactly, it's all of those. So when it's deleted, it's not necessarily a lot of times you can go up and you can pull up. I think Facebook has the ability to download your your uh, previous messages. And so you can kind of look at that. And it, it's it's primarily because if you post something out on social media, somebody screen captures that and they do a post with that same information, even though you have deleted it, it doesn't mean somebody else doesn't have it. Um, and so that is kind of when when I speak of that, that's that's what exactly what I'm talking about is because. And I apologize. I'm trying to move you to a different location because I'm getting distracted here. Um, so, yeah, that's exactly it. Is is the information that you've posted now has been shared by how many other people? Um, you can share a link, so it's really never gone. Okay, uh, Melissa says, "Are not me." Another Melissa <laughs> says, "Are web browsers really incognito?" No, it is not. 
uh, it may block it from uh, some of the some of the traffic insights, but a lot of that information is still out there. And I'm not real super familiar. I mean, I'm familiar from the perspective of a digital forensics perspective. Uh, incognito means really nothing. Uh, we can still get information and see information that's out there. So, um, and if we can see it, my guess is other people can see it as well. So it's a great resource and it's a great way to try to hide information. But if you think about when you go on a website, especially from the forensic perspective, is those images are stored all over. And even though you're incognito, those images have to be displayed on the screen and those are being stored. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, we have a follow-up question. Um, will using Tor browser help you with your privacy? Tor will help you with browsers, but there are a lot of people that are um, intercepting the Tor uh, network. And I think at one time, and I don't quote me on this, but I do believe that there was uh, some leaking. Uh, I used to use Tor uh, primarily just trying to protect myself. VPN is a great way that's kind of going through and it's still storing on your local mach machine, but it, it's not completely incognito. Um, I Nothing, nothing's not the possibilities of, of hacking or intercepting uh, information. Well, to go a little bit out, out of order, we had Connor who asked how good are VPNs at keeping your privacy? They do a pretty good job, especially because it's not storing information on a PC that you are physically on. So a VPN is probably the better way to do it. Um, but you're tunneling into another device and that other device is storing information. So, um, but from the perspective of your, if, if you're uh, on a business or on a computer that is, um, let's say in a hotel, it is a great way to keep that information being uh, seen by them because it's not all you do are, you're tunneling to your machine of whatever VPN you're using. And that's why a lot of businesses use it. So it's a great way to uh, basically prevent your information being um, hijacked uh, using free network. And that that's another thing that you don't want to do is use free network because people are looking at all information and the business is providing it. Want your information to try to give you more product. Okay. Um, another question from Melissa says, I have a teen. What's your best advice today with regards to tech and social? It's interesting. Uh, so the best thing is, is have an open line of communications. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. And telling somebody they can't get on uh, social media and taking it away um, sounds like a great option. And, and honestly, I did it. Um, but I can tell you from my perspective, it didn't work. Uh, but second thing is, is that these kids nowadays live on it and that's their life. Um, and the thing I would suggest is limit time. If you have the ability to like, if you have a router that you're able to set up times that people uh, are the amount of time that they're on the network, that's the big thing. Um, if you've looked at the social dilemma, they talk about screen time and that's where people and businesses are making money is screen time. And I think the same thing goes with youth is you have to say, here's your, here's how much time you get on the internet. Um, and then you try to monitor it the best you can. You can't be perfect. And honestly, uh, one of the things that I learned not to give parenting advice, cause I was not the greatest parent, but is that, you know, don't be so restrictive that they can't do what they want to. That's the time for them to make mistakes is while they're under your house. And yes, there are times that it may cause, um, your pride to get stepped on with the community or friends or family, but who's more important? Is it the child? Is it you? Who is it? And so that's the things that, you know, the thing I have, I guess the advice is limit, um, if you can, the type of content you're, they're viewing depending on their age. Um, and then you just try to have that open line of communications. That's, you know, there's, there's actually some uh, YouTube videos about a guy out there and he's like, you know, let this, his daughter asked about going out and doing this. And he's like, sure, go do it. You know, and then he talks about how people restrict it and, and how they're going to do it anyway. Um, my daughter, uh, I'll give an example, is she uh, had somebody else, one of her friends, give her a phone and I had no control over it. So I couldn't see what's going on. And so once I found the phone, you know that turned into a discussion, but it was my fault. Um, I was the one that uh, basically prevented her to have a, her own device to do that to where I could somewhat monitor it. And, and that's the thing is just try to monitor what they're doing. That's a good, good answer. 
Um, question from James. You brought up strong passwords, but I have trouble remembering them and really don't want to write them down. How do you remember? How do you recommend keeping track of all of them? Well, there's all kinds of tools out there and you have to be very careful with these. Um, I, I don't want to mention any particular tool, but I use a password storing tool um, that basically can be accessed all over the various platforms. Could it be hacked? Sure. Um, I kind of do the risk reward thing and that's how I do life as whole. Um, even when on social media, how much of a risk is this to me? Um, the thing that I would suggest is finding a device that you could have like one password and use it to access um, those files, but just make sure that it's, it's secure. It's not, security is not cheap um, and you're going to have to pay for it. Um, so, and most of those actually have password generators and those passwords are ridiculous. Um, uh, there's no way I could remember them. And honestly, I reset my password quite frequently on my bank records because I cannot remember what they are. Um, don't use the same password, use multiple passwords um, and just use some type of way to manage it um, that is secure, that requires some type of facial identification, uh, second second uh, authentication. So that way, you know, if somebody's getting, gaining access to that, uh, same thing goes with any or any or uh, social media platforms is you have two factor authentication. It's a pain, but I can tell you that there's been times where I was like, wait a minute, I didn't request that. Now it was my wife, but you know, that at least told me that she was trying to use my account. So um, yes. So use some type of device, uh, wouldn't write it down um, because with your phone, at least it's an app and it has a password to the phone and then you have a password to the app. So um, I don't want to give a recommendation on what's, which one's best because then as soon as I do, and they get hacked, now you're gonna call me and say, hey, Mark, uh, you told me about this app and now they have all my passwords, so. Uh, Ryan has a question, is Google Home a safe way to do this um, or is Google going to gouging us for data by pretending to keep us safe? You know, Google, I love Google and I use Google for everything, right? Um, but I will tell you, Google gets a lot of information from me and Google gives you the option to turn a lot of that off just like Apple does as well. And Apple, I know not everybody's an Apple fan and I get that. Um, I'm an Apple guy uh, primarily because of what, and I get, I shouldn't be given any uh, thoughts, but it has a password uh, thing inside of it to protect. Um, and it has a password to um, get in the phone and then you can use a password to get to your passwords on an Apple device. And I'm sure, um, other platforms, Android, what have you, has the same type of thing. But Google, um, I use Google Keep to keep a lot of my notes. I do not keep passwords in those notes. Um, but Google does mine a lot of information. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, if you go into Google sometime, download your data and see what's there. Uh, you will be thoroughly surprised. And let me just tell you, you better have a large hard drive to do that. So check it out for yourself. Um, same thing with Facebook. You can download your data from Facebook. Um, and see what information they have for the most part, what's out there. Um, so uh, Google's a great tool. Just understand they're, they are mining information. Are they looking for your passwords? Likely not. Um, hackers, can they get in or possibly get it? Yeah, they have two-factor authentication for Google. So, I mean, there's it's fairly secure, but they're going to know everything about you and try to provide you products. So um, this, this theory of somebody listening to you is typically because you've given them access and uh, it's probably Google or Apple listening to you. It's not it's not the United States government not saying they're not gathering that information. But for the most part, the ones you need to be worried about is the uh, various manufacturer, various people out there that are trying to provide a better service for you. But in act actuality, they are probably not doing so. Well, I have a question myself and I don't know if you can answer this, but what other social you mentioned other social media platforms besides Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and things like that. Are there any that you particularly recommend that seem a little bit more friendly, I guess? Wow. Um, hmm. I, I don't I don't know that I would recommend any specific one. I mean, personally, I use Facebook as my primary social media. Um, I have a Twitter account. I have um, a Snapchat, which really, I mean, it's not necessarily a platform, uh, but it's a way to communicate with people. They're all about the same. I mean, you had TikTok that had the issue with China. Uh, you've had, you know, uh, 
I, I'll just say that nine times out of 10, your data, even though you feel it's deleted, uh, Snapchat, you know, it deletes after that. No, it's not. It's not gone. It's still there. And there's some images I do not want to see anymore. And, and so don't use social media to send your information. But others are there's which ones out there. I, I hate to give it a, a one in specific. No, that's, I mean, uh, that's fair. Uh, um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I guess I'll ask for one last call for any questions for Mark while we have him here. You've got several people that said thank you. Uh, that This was a great presentation. I think it was really useful. It's given me a lot to think about. My general rule is I try not to post things my mom can't read. Um, sometimes yeah. that works, sometimes that doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't mean post in a second language because they have, they have those interpreters. But <laughs> Right. I, you know, like I said, it's just it's just uh, it's somewhat using common sense. And, you know, this virtual reality, uh, it's it's going to be a dangerous thing and law is going to have to catch up to it. I mean, because it's really something it's not, you know, you're talking about avatars and but they get pretty graphic. So, yeah, I it's it's unfortunate. It's a sad world we live in. And, and I'm probably one of those people where I'm very I question everything just because I don't trust a lot of people and I don't trust what's on social media because you see these things. And, and that's the other thing, taking a take home from it is just because you see it on Facebook, just because you see it on social media. And even if you see it on CNN, it doesn't mean it's absolutely hundred percent true. Uh, listen to all aspects of it and then uh, kind of take the two together and mesh them. And you're typically going to have a 10th of, you know, the information that's, that's legit. So um yeah, I appreciate you having the give me the opportunity to do so. And and hopefully like I said again, hopefully there's one piece of information that's helpful to you, because if it is that that's made my day. And, and uh, again, not perfect. Uh, mental health is definitely something that we are probably going to struggle with over the next few years, especially with, you know, the things that are going on with the covid. So uh, don't let social media get at you. Don't let anybody get at you. Um, be who you are and be what you are. And uh the people that you see on the Facebook typically are fake. So, um, and they're back to that whole conversation about the deep fake. They're not the digress, but uh, there are actually, uh, if you look up deep fake, you'll see images of people that are not really people, but they look like people. So wow. all computer generated. So. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thank you again for this. I think that was amazing. A ton of information. I'm sure lots of people got way more than just one point that was useful. So thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it.